Good morning. We'd like to welcome everyone to the morning worship services here at the Jacksonville Church of Christ. If you're visiting, we're so glad to have you. Please stick around so we can get to know you a little bit better after services. There are going to be some black booklets being passed around. If you would, please fill out a record of your attendance there. And we're going to be opening up the worship services this morning with a scripture reading. If you would, please turn with me to Judges 14, verses 5 through 14. Judges 14, 5 through 14. So Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. Now to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him and he tore the lion apart as one would have torn apart a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand. But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman and she pleased Samson well. After some time, when he returned to get her, he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion, and behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the carcass of the lion. He took some of it in his hands and went along eating. When he came to his father and mother, he gave some to them, and they also ate. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. So his father went down to the woman, and Samson gave a feast there, for young men used to do so. And it happened when they saw him that they brought thirty companions to be with him. Then Samson said to them, Let me pose a riddle to you. If you can correctly solve and explain it to me within the seven days of the feast, then I will give you thirty linen garments and thirty changes of clothing. But if you cannot explain it to me, then you shall give me thirty linen garments and thirty changes of clothing. And they said to him, Pose your riddle that we may hear it. So he said to them, Out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. Now for three days they could not explain the riddle. If you'd like, you may stand for this first number. Ninety-six, Brother Ken Denton will lead us as we pray.
Let's join together in prayer. Father, we come to you this morning through Jesus' name. So thankful for the blessings that you bestow on us and most thankful for our Savior Jesus. And Father, the plan of salvation and the hope of eternal life that we have through that plan. Lord, we pray that we will strive every day to live our life faithful to you and have a heavenly reward at the end of this life. Father, we are thankful for the congregation here at Jacksonville. We are thankful for the church the world over. Lord, we pray that we will be instrumental here, Lord, to help spread the, the gospel throughout the world and especially here in the Jacksonville community. Lord, we are thankful for each and every member here, Lord, and all the works that are, that are done. We are thankful for an eldership that <clears throat> leads and guides us, Father, and watches over our soul, and we pray that every decision they make, Lord, they will seek your will and do proper. Father, help us to support these men and their families and never be a burden to them. Father, we are also thankful and blessed at, at Jacksonville with the ministers we have and the great work that they do, and we ask your blessing on them and their families as well. Lord, we are mindful of our, our sick. We pray that you will, will be with all of the sick, Lord, especially those that have um, long-term illness. Lord, we pray that you will be with them throughout their treatments. Be with their families, Lord, as this is a, a trying time. Father, we pray for those that are spiritually sick. Father, those that have chosen just not to be here, whatever the case may be, Father, we pray that something will be said or done that will remind them of their first love and return to the church. Father, be with those that are suffering through any emotional uh, things, Father. Life can sometimes be tough, Father. We pray a, a special prayer for those. Father, we are mindful of those also that have lost someone dear to them and that are grieving at this time. Father, just please, we ask that you, that you bless them. Father, we are thankful for Brother Todd this morning, and Lord, the, we pray now that you will give him a ready recollection of what he has studied for us, help us to be attentive, and, and always be yearning to learn from your, your word. Go with us through the rest of this time, Father, as we worship you. Father, we ask that everything we do will be in accordance to your will. We ask these things through Jesus. Amen. One hundred seven for the Lord's Supper. Sing verse two and three for the Lord's Supper. May we keep in memory all the
May we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this first day of the week that you've allowed us to have. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this unleavened bread that represents Jesus' body upon the cross. May we each one examine ourselves and partake of this in remembrance of him. In Jesus' name, amen. pray again. In like manner, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this cup, the fruit of the vine, which represents Jesus' blood that was shed upon the cross for our sins. May we each one examine ourselves and take worthy in thy sight. In Jesus' name, amen.
sing the first verse. Oft we come together, oft we sing and May we pray once again. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all the many wonderful abilities that you give each one of us. Thank you for the talents that we have to go out and earn a living. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for all the many blessings that you give us daily. And we ask that this money that's being used here today may help those that's less fortunate and for the future spreading of your word throughout the land. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> If you're using a book, you may mark number 424. 424 be our song of invitation. Let's sing together number 318 before Brother Todd speaks to us. We're glad to have Brother Todd O'Donnell and his family with us today. Looking forward to a great lesson. Let's stand. 318.
um, spend some time with you over this weekend. I uh, do appreciate the hospitality and, and getting to see a lot of the folks that we got to meet last time we were here, two years ago, and at PTP. And um, it was started out in the class today talking about the, um, the Bible and the bees. And of course, uh, as many of you will know, I'm a beekeeper back home in New Zealand. That's how we make our living. And uh, we're running about 850 hives at the moment. And um, so we've got uh, plenty, plenty of work to do. And there's a lot of lessons that can be learned about the bees. We looked this morning uh, for the adult class at um, the amount of work that gets done by the bees in pollinating, pollinating the crops, the, uh, the fruit trees, the vegetables, um, uh, nut plants, and, and things of that nature. Uh, we, we look at all of the different jobs that the um, bees have to do, a variety of different jobs. They all, all do well. And uh, here we have the bee. Is, um, it's a relatively small little critter, but, it, um, but it's mighty in its own right. Well, you compare the size of the, the bee. I don't know why I selected a bear, but I thought that was a pretty cool picture of a grizzly bear. We went to Yellowstone Park, uh, Park is that what it's called? National Park one year, and um, we were, we'd, we'd uh, saw a, a grizzly bear and her cubs had tracked down in the night and had, um, they'd kind of slept in some bushes there and in the morning got up to have a look and uh, we were standing on the bridge looking at the grizzly bear and then all of a sudden some cars pulled up because it's like, oh, they're looking at something and she did the old turn around, stood up on her back legs and did the, just like that one there, except up in the air with its hands and I got to see that with my own bare eyes and I was glad I was on the bridge and close to a car. Uh, we were some distance away, but it was, um, anyway, bears are pretty uh, amazing critters. But you think about the work that a little bee does, pretty, pretty insignificant, really, pretty small, you would think. But um, over its lifetime, a bee is really not going to produce that much. One tw twelfth of a teaspoon doesn't seem like a whole lot, does it? But you multiply it by the workforce. See, and in a beehive, you've got upwards of um, 60, maybe 70,000 in a super strong hive, maybe 80,000 bees that are in that hive. And so you think about the amount of um, accumulated work that can be done. And so bees can produce um, quite a huge amount of, of honey. Uh, we've, the best year we've had, we produced 25 ton of manuka honey. 25 ton is a lot of, uh, is a lot of honey. You know, and uh, of course there's others that produce more and obviously others that produce less, but these bees, they do fascinating work and they've got to make um, uh, a lot of trips, 50,000 trips, uh, not one bee making 50,000 trips, but a, a lot of bees making, uh, they've estimated 50,000 trips out to the flowers uh, need to be made in order to produce just uh, two pounds of honey, which is one kilogram or 2.2 pounds to, to a kilo. So it's the accumulated work that they do together. Small, but they, they do a lot. Now, um, when, when these bees are, are doing the work they do, and they're, they're flying all about, they're landing, they have this, um, they've observed a special like, strategy that the bees use, because they've, um, they, they come in and they've got to adjust their, their flight, and uh, be able to land uh, on the flowers. Sometimes they've got to come up underneath, upside down, and uh, God has pre-programmed these bees to be able to work out the angles, the angles and the, 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 the flight paths, paths and, and things that they need they to do. So, so these bees, these bees aren't, aren't crashing uh, all, the all the time and, uh, and failing, failing to, to land on the, the uh, on flowers, the flowers they, need they, they need to get to. And so, and so um, um, they're, uh, they're, uh, they're amazing critters now. The thing, the thing that I was thinking of was the likes of Gideon, who, you know, they have big army and they're going to go against the Midianites, but God wants to make sure that he gets the credit, right, right. And so, and so reduce the size of the army, army down, down really, really, really the, the size of the army, army, army reduced, reduced down, down to a, to a small, small number, number. So, that so that it was recognised that God, God is going to get the glory, glory for this battle. battle. Because, because typically an army of 300 is not going to be able to defeat, defeat the, um, the Midianites. Midianites. Then you then have, you uh, of course, David in 1 Samuel 17, defeating Goliath. Goliath. And yet David was just a little lad, and he was able to defeat defeat the giant. 
Um, and then, of course, in uh, Matthew 25, you've got the, the, the parable that's being told about the men who are given uh, talents, money, in accordance with their ability. Here's the thing. You got the, the, the one, the two, and the five talent man in accordance with their ability. That one talent man was expected to use the ability that he had. And I think sometimes we, you know, we kind of we want the, the big grandiose. We want to do something big for the Lord. Yeah, you know, we want to do something great for the Lord. And and yet a lot of times all that the Lord is requiring of us is to do just do what what we what we do. Um, we don't have to be a great and mighty uh, to do great work. See, God looks at us, and when we come into a right relationship with Him, uh, and we, it's like for a lot of people, perhaps they think, well, that's it. You know, um, hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, full immersion for the forgiveness of sins, and that's the end. But yet, yeah, that's not the end, it's a beginning, that's the new birth. And um, what, what God has then created us to do in Christ is to, we've been created for good works. We are his workmanship, according to Ephesians 2 and verse 10. His masterpiece. We're his masterpiece. And so even though we may at times look at ourselves in the overall scheme of things, uh, as an individual, I think, well, I'm, I'm nothing spectacular. I'm nothing great. Uh, we might think of the church as being relatively small compared to, say, other organizations that we see around the place, and yet, and yet we can accomplish great work. I think of the work that, um, that the little bees uh, are able to do uh, in, in providing for hu humanity, uh, the food that's put on our plates, um, and then the amount of, uh, of food that they produce for themselves, and it's, it's phenomenal just how tirelessly they work. But, but there's not one, one bee doing anything that's hugely exceptional. It's the, it's the pooling together of the work of all of, of everyone who's doing their part. And so we don't have to be, you know, um, we don't have to be like Goliath. We could just be like David, you know. We just do, do the best that we can do where we find ourselves. Um, nutrition is vital for the bees. You, you look at, there's a couple of hives to the right, there's just a single box, but it's overflowing with bees. Uh, there's a couple of um, uh, hives to the left there that have, uh, you know, they've, they've got a honey box on top, probably two brood boxes there, and they're just crammed out with, with bees. You know, bees are actually the fastest um, growing livestock on the earth. When you think, well, chickens grow really quick, but um, bees actually, once they start to multiply and once they start growing as a, as a unit, if you measure the weight of the bees that are being produced, it's, a, it's phenomenal how quickly um, a hive will expand. So what will happen, like we get back to New Zealand in August, uh, the, the, the hives hopefully will have come through okay. The, the, the bees that have brought them through the winter will be there. They, will, they would have been in the cluster, um, keeping the queen warm. There won't be any breeding that's been going on. And then come uh, August, uh, the queen will sort of get warmer um, back home. Of course, the seasons are opposite. So uh, they'll start to build up in, in their numbers. The, there will be a dying off of all of the old bees and then you'll be left with basically the, you know, the um, uh, a critical mass of bees, and then the queen's got to get to work. We've got to get to work. We've got to feed. Uh, they've got to get the right nutrition to expand. And very quickly, over a period of weeks, we're trying to get the colony to expand up to to where it's pumping like these hives here, so that they're ready for the honey flow, for the nectar flow. Um, but it requires a lot of, uh, you know, they've got to have a, um, the diet has to be nutrient rich for them to do this. And so basically um, you're feeding raw jelly will be fed and then honey will be fed and then pollen, which has been gone through a bit of a process in the hive, it's sort of fermented, it's called bee bread and uh, they, will, they will feed them this bee bread as well. But it, What's really interesting about the queen, the queen bee 
is basically it starts out the same as a female worker bee starts out as a, as a fertilized egg. But the, the key difference is the diet that it's fed. So it gets fed copious quantities of royal jelly. And this royal jelly enables the queen to, to develop. She'll be a lot bigger than the, the worker bees. It allow, allows her ovaries to develop. The cell, there'll be a cell that she, or a little cocoon that she'll be put in that's bigger that has this raw jelly packed into it. And so this diet, this food, is going to change the basically the destiny of, uh, of what this egg started out to be. It could have been a female worker bee, but it ends up being a, a queen bee. Now, um, this bee bread is pretty fascinating too because the bee bread, it's been found, has a chemical in it that helps to keep the, uh, the workers um, sterile. So the queen doesn't really have any fighting going on within the, the hive with reference to the workers because of the bee bread and the chemical that's found in the bee bread and also the pheromones that are being uh, released by the queen. And so um, I was just thinking about the amount of food that is required. If you have a gap, if you had a break uh, in, in your pollen um, food, if you have a break in the nectar and the honey that is required for a, a colony to grow, to that degree the colony is, uh, is set back. You know, so for the Christian, of course, uh, we are encouraged, like newborn babes, to long the pure milk of the word so that by it we can, we can grow. We, we have to keep an eye on the diet that we're being fed, spiritually speaking. And, you know, unfortunately for many people around the world, in this country, even in this community maybe, um, the diet that they're getting of a spiritual nature is, um, is not... Uh, is not is not enough. It's not enough of. It's not got the quality. It's not nutrient rich. You know, there's a lot of people being served up a diet of uh, spiritual food that is is just uh, not going to help them to grow. And so we think about Jesus saying uh, on the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes there in Matthew five and verse six that uh, we ought to hunger and thirst. For righteousness, it ought to be what, what we want so that we can grow. And then, of course, the Hebrews 5 passage there and verses uh, 11 through to the end of Hebrews 5 that there were, there were Christians there who there had been an elapsing of time, a period of time, and they should have grown and they should have matured and they should have been able to eat the meat, but they were still just feeding on the milk. You know, we've got to keep. We've got to keep our minds active. We've got to keep reading the scriptures. We've got to keep coming along to the classes and, and, and working to learn uh, about God's will so that we can grow. This is one of the most fascinating aspects of the bees is the, the communication system um, that they have. And so what bees will do in, in order to communicate with each other, um, they, will, they will perform a dance. And you might have heard about this, the dance, the bee dance that's done. What, uh, what happens is that the, there is a source, a nectar source that will be out in a field somewhere and scout bees will go out and they will be scouting around trying to find a, a nectar source or a pollen source and when they find that they will um, scoot on down and, and get some nectar and then they will fly back to the hive. Well when they come back to the hive what they do is they perform a, a dance, and this dance then is observed by the foragers who are in the hive, and they are able to interpret this dance. Now it's fascinating because what happens is the bee will do the uh, will do this dance, and it kind of uh, it, there's a picture there. The picture is of the bee in the middle there, and it, it's it's sort of shaking its its body. You can see them doing it sometimes when you pull out a frame. And they'll move uh, up the comb or down the comb at a particular angle. And basically what is communicated um, is that if they're going up the comb, it means that the nectar source is in the direction of the sun. If they're going down the comb, it's away from the sun. And then if it's on an angle, uh, as uh, you know, this, this, uh, the diagram on the right, um, it's showing that uh, it's, it's all with reference to the sun. 
And so I'm fascinated by this, that these bees, again, you think about from an evolutionary standpoint, where the, you know, my, my question would be, how, how would bees be able to learn to do this? I mean, we can be taught to, to perform a, a, a dance, and, um, you know, but what about if we had to perform a dance that communicated something to someone else, and then that dance would have to be interpreted? You know, how, how do you learn that? Bees only live for such a short period of time. It's a, and God has placed it instinctively within them to do this. And what's fascinating is that this dance, not only is it conveying the direction of the food source, but it's also conveying the distance that they have to travel, because that's important, isn't it? I mean, if you've got to fuel up, I hope that they've calculated very carefully how much fuel is required to fly from um, you know, the United States across the Pacific to New Zealand, because I want a full tank, you know? I don't want them running, um, we don't want to be running out. It's the same for the bee. They need to be able to take on enough energy, enough fuel to get out there, do the job, and then bring the supplies back. So it communicates direction, it communicates distance. Also, as this bee there is doing the waggle dance, it will share some of the nectar. It'll share some of the quality uh, of the nectar with the bees so they can sort of determine whether it's worth all of the trouble. And um, now, uh, this is amazing that a, a bee knows to do the dance and then the dance has to be interpreted and understood correctly so that the bee can go out and do what it needs to do. But additionally, there's a, um, there's a little problem, really, is over time, as this bee's doing the waggle dance, if it's, if it's got to do with reference to where the hive is and where the sun is and where the source is, every four minutes the sun is basically shifting its position, well, we're shifting, but the position is, is altered, isn't it, by one degree every four minutes. So it's interesting that when the bees are observed to do this waggle dance, that the angle of the dance is changed by the bees by one degree every four minutes to, to make allowance for the, you know, for the position that's changing with reference to the sun. As, so it, again, this is fascinating stuff. I think of Romans 1 and verse 20 all the time when I'm out, you know, looking at the bees and it of course Romans 1 and verse 20 is talking about seeing you know seeing God in the creation seeing his power seeing his ingenuity seeing the way that God has worked things out and um, so of course the application here then is uh, that God has given us has communicated with us it's interesting then that you know if, if we can arrive we can arrive at a at a first cause for this universe um, I, I like to keep it nice and simple, man. We only have three options, you know. Um, we, uh, the universe has come about from nothing, the universe has always been, or the universe was created. And uh, nothing has ever been observed to come from, from um, something has never been observed to come from nothing, so, so we, we really have no reason to believe that the first one uh, that the universe is eternal, well, the, the universe is running down. I, I just simply can't um, accept or believe that there's any evidence to really show that matter and the universe and the energy within it is, is eternal. So even if I don't have huge amounts of evidence for, for the third option, it's the only one that I'm left with, is that there is a creator who has made us. Of course, there is a lot of evidence that points to that, um, that conclusion that we have a God. Well, so, well, some people say, so what? Well, has that God communicated with us? Well, what's interesting then is that you see communication throughout the, you know, throughout the natural world. Uh, insects communicate with each other. God has allowed the bees to communicate with each other. God has created us to communicate with each other. So why then would we think that he would not want to communicate with us? And of course he has through his word. And so he's given us the scriptures, he's given us um, in the inspired word that can direct us in the way that we need to go. He's given us everything that pertains to life 
and godliness, told us everything that we need need to know. And uh, this word has been supported. Uh, it's shown to be true. Uh, we have a great deal of confidence in, in the word of God, and we should. Uh, and so in Psalm 19 and verses uh, 7 through 11, we find that God's word, his words, his laws are described as being um, sweeter than, than honey, sweeter than the honeycomb. And uh, I like it that God's, God's word, which is so important and to be treasured and to be valued as compared to, uh, to, to getting that honeycomb. Sometimes when you're out and uh, we might be up in the hills and, and we're working on the highs and we might have more to do than we expected to do and we're running low on food and so we can just pull out a frame of that delicious honey and just stick the hive tool into it and just, um, just grab that honey straight out of the hive and in the comb. And, it's, um, and if, you, if you're tired and lacking energy and you want something to eat, well, then that's a, a, a wonderful treat and gives you the energy and boosts you up to keep doing the work that you've got to do. But God's word is described like that. It's, um, it's, it's really, I'm amazed at what I see in the Bible. I studied uh, the Bear Valley Bible Institute has a satellite program in New Zealand. And I had the privilege of being able to teach one of the classes there recently on uh, worship, worship um, principles, doctrines, and practices. And I tell you, as I went through, and you think after being a Christian for many years that, well, you'd, you'd have this worship thing nailed down. And, uh, but it was amazing that when I, I started to read from Genesis through to Revelation, just zeroed in on worship. And it was just amazing what you... It, it's amazing after reading the Bible for so long and studying it, but then to read it again zeroed in, tunnel visioned on worship, just how much information is contained there uh, in, our, in, in the Bible about worship. It, there are significant amounts of information given, and, but it's like you're reading it new and you're reading it fresh and it's encouraging and it helps me to, to know, that, you know that we're on the right track because, you know, worship is one of those things that we ought not to mess with. That's what you learn when you read through the Old Testament you find that God was detailed, he was specific, he told people what he wanted, he explained how he wanted it done, and that's what he expected. And people were not at liberty to change it according to their whims, according to their personal feelings or, or opinions or likes or dislikes. They needed to do what God had asked them to do. And that's why we just have a simple uh, worship today, New Testament worship. Um, so... Uh, God's word, it's just, uh, it's, it's really, and it's so beneficial and, and helpful to us too. Love reading through the Proverbs, you know, such good stuff in there for us. Um, the swarms are the uh, passage that Daniel read for us from Judges 14, was of that account of um, uh, Samson. I was going to say Tarzan, but it's Samson. Um, <laughs> You, that, someone said, oh, I heard that joke one time, of, and, and that's what always messes me up, was the uh, the preacher's, the wife said, oh, well, what was your sermon about today? And he was all upset because she didn't listen. Well, didn't you listen? No, no, but what was it about? And uh, he said, well, it was about Samson. And uh, she said, well, you keep calling him Tarzan. But um, anyway, we got uh, Samson here, and he's killed the lion, and, uh, of course, the lion has died, and um, obviously there's been some decay, and there's a cavity, a, a dry cavity there, uh, probably in the lion's chest, and that's a perfect place for a, a swarm to go into. What will happen with a swarm? It's a way of reproduction. It's a way of um, producing another colony. So what will happen, oftentimes, usually in the springtime, as that hive is expanding and is exploding, um, they will, it'll start to run out of room. And when that happens, there is, um, the bees basically get prepared to, to swarm. And what they will do is the, um, the, the colony gets, um, gets geared up. They build, I think I've got a, oh yeah, they build some queen cups there. Uh, so they'll, they'll start building these queen cups and then they'll have those um, ready. And then once they think they're running out of room, the queen will lay an egg We'll lay an egg in there, and then uh, that's not an egg, that's actually an egg that's hatched out, that's a larvae, but it, it's all the milky stuff is royal jelly, so they're feeding it the royal jelly. And then 
uh, it will go into, uh, they will seal it off and it will be in there with raw jelly and then eventually that's going to hatch out. So what happens is just before the virgin queens hatch out of these cells, the old queen will take off with 50-60% um, of, the, of the bees and um, they'll fly to the side of your house, brother. He's got a swarm in the side of his house and they'll make their home there. And, um, and then what will happen is uh, the queens will hatch out of these cells. Maybe one will hatch out first and it will scurry across and it will try and kill uh, the queens while they're in the, before they've hatched out. It will pick the, the side of the cell down, sting them, and, um, and that will be the end of them. Or if they hatch out simultaneously, they'll, um, they'll end up meeting and it'll be a fight to the death. And um, so then you've got the queen who's won the battle. She's now the queen back in the parent hive. Then she'll fly out, go on a mating trip, a flight, come back, and now she's ready to go. She'll start laying eggs. So now you've gone from one colony uh, to two. And um, the other, the colony that's gone away normally flies not too far away from the parent hive. Scout bees go out, they start uh, moving out to try and find somewhere to call home. And you might uh, see, I'll just go backwards, you'll often see um, swarms up in trees uh, like these. That's quite a large swarm actually, but um, yeah, people think, Swarms actually are not, not very dangerous at all. People freak out and, and go running and do more harm to themselves trying to get away than the bees would do. They're generally not very aggressive when they're swarming because they've got no honey to defend, no hive to defend, and uh, they've just gorged themselves on honey, and so they're feeling fat and um, you know not mean-spirited at all. And uh, they're just looking for a, for a home. In fact, if there's a swarm that's come out of a hive, you can stand right in the midst of it, and there's the bees flying all around, and they'll they'll they won't do anything to you. So, um, but uh, the, the law of biogenesis is a law that says life begets life, and that of its kind, and that's true. You know, uh, dogs always give rise to dogs, cats always give rise to cats. You, you get um, apples give rise to apples, and bees give rise to bees. This is how God has organized bees so that they can, they can reproduce and have another colony so that if this one dies out, you've got another one over here that uh, keeps the bees going. And of course, it allows them to spread. So bees are basically spread throughout the world. They've got that important job uh, to do. Well, this to me, it, it's not really like evangelism, uh, individual evangelism. This is more like the church plant, you know. Once you get the building filled up and its capacity, uh, have a swarm, you know. Move off into another community, you know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it was God's plan to have the mega churches. I'm not sure if that was His plan at all. I'm not saying it's wrong. It just. I think perhaps more good could be done if we would just um, move off and start another congregation. And I think that's what we need to be doing as the church. The, the idea is that we, we get a congregation, we build it up, we get it to the point where it's, you know, we need to do something. Well, let's move into another community and have an impact and an influence in, uh, in, in that community. Right. Um, we might have time for one more quick point and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll call it quits and see you tonight. I didn't know how this was going to work. I just threw a whole lot of stuff. Alan said, do you do three lessons on the bees? And I was like, okay, we'll see, see how that goes. But um, anyway, I hope it's somewhat interesting to you. It's interesting to me. Um, you're always concerned because you think what's interesting to me may be not interesting to other people. But anyway, uh, so we talked about the pheromones earlier. The queen releases these um, chemicals and the bees have about 170 sort of odour uh, um, receptors, and so they've got a real, very sensitive uh, to, to smell. When we, especially when there's no honey flow on in the spring or in the autumn, you can drive the truck into to an apiary site, and you might have just a speck of honey uh, on the back of the truck. And I tell you what, within seconds, it seems like, 
the bees have made their way to the truck. They can smell the minutest, they sense the minutest uh, bit of honey on the back of the truck, and so they're highly sensitive. So uh, these pheromones help to keep, uh, keep the hive in balance. Uh, it's a way, again, of, of communicating. Um, and it's very, I mean, again, you begin to think about how could this, from the, an evolutionary perspective, how could this have evolved? How could this slowly have happened where, where you've got a queen that's able to develop, um, you know, 15 glands that are going to secrete various combinations of um, scent that's going to communicate and have an influence on the population. And at the same time, the worker bees and the drones are developing the receptors to be able to take on board. You know, it just it, it really defies explanation. Uh, you know, other than the fact that God created them and designed them to be this way. Uh, and it's a highly complex way of um, recognizing things. So you, one of the uses that they will have is they've, they don't really train the bees, but they, they'll, they'll use them in detecting bombs. And um, you probably think, well, that sounds a bit odd. But, but look it up and you'll get the full... Uh, range of what or the explanation of what they're doing is they get these bees to be able to detect explosives and of course um, it's probably better that a few bees get blown up than a few um, humans so we, we use the bees to, to, to de detect bombs detect explosives and um, of course here as I mentioned earlier the the pheromones the unique scent that a queen gives off and they each give off a different scent unites the hive it keeps it together as a unit and of course the thing that keeps us together and brings us together from all walks of, of life and all different backgrounds and cultures and, and nations and is the blood of Christ it, the blood of Christ has brought us together it's united us together and as such Jesus prayed that we would be one that we would keep the unity um, and it wouldn't be unity at the expense of truth. It would be unity based upon the truth. And so we have a unity. And, and we are to be diligent to preserve, to preserve that unity, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. It takes effort to preserve unity. Just previous to him saying that uh, in Ephesians 4, just in the verses 1 and 2, he talks about sort of attitudes of, um, you know, sort of arrogant attitudes, angry words, jealousy, spite, things of that nature, things that would fit into that category, and then talks about uh, being gentle and kind, you know, and forgiving one another, and then being diligent to preserve the unity. Many times <coughs> people have disunity and division amongst themselves, and it doesn't really have anything to do with the, the truth necessarily. It has to do with um, stinky attitudes, you know, stinky behaviours that cause problems. And that's where we need to be diligent to preserve the unity uh, for the betterment of the whole. So, um, look, one, one thing that we, we do know about, um, about the bees, what most people know about bees is that they sting. And uh, the number one question that I'm asked, the number one question I'm asked by people is, uh, so number one is, um, do you get stung? Number two is, um, the question that was asked before, are your bees dying out? And uh, number three question, oh, how many hives do you have? Uh, so those three questions are asked repeatedly. But number one is always, do you get stung? Well, the Bible talks about a sting in 1 Corinthians 15. It talks, um, it speaks about death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? There, there, is, there is an element of pain when it comes to death. And the, the real element is this, as he goes on to say, is sin. The, the real sting is sin that hasn't been dealt with. And ultimately, that sin that we haven't dealt with will cost cost us our soul, it will cause us to be separated from God. But you see, that chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, is talking about the resurrection and the wonderful victory and hope that we have over death. 
and it's through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so no one wants to be stung by a bee and people will drive off the road and smash their car into a lamppost and end up in hospital with broken arms and broken legs trying to avoid a little sting from a bee. Um, that happened to my grandfather. A bee flew behind his glasses. I claimed that it was a, a wasp. But anyway, they, the uncles like to tell us say it was a bee. Why blame the bee? I blame a wasp. But anyway, they say it was a bee. But he drove his car off the road trying to get a bee away uh, from getting a little sting, and he, he, he sl slid into a lamppost and uh, cut his car in half. But, um, but the things that we will do to avoid the sting, you know, we wave our hands around and kids are hollering. It's always, you know, a um, horrible experience for a kid to step on a bee and get stung, and yet there's a biblical, um, you know, lesson that we can draw from that. Well, this is, this is what sin can, can cause, you know, a horrible sting, but we can have victory over that. So this morning, what we would say is, um, as much as you don't like getting stung by the bee, you're going to not, the sting of dying outside of Christ and dying with sin on your hands is even worse, and it's an eternal sting. We can have freedom from sin through the blood of Christ. And the Bible says that when we're baptized into Christ, we, you know, we meet him there. In John 6 and verses 3 and 4, um, we, we bring this old sinful person, and then it tells us there that we're baptized with Christ. That's where we meet him is uh, when we are immersed in, in water and then we're raised up with him to walk in newness of life and it's not a work of merit it's not the type of work that Ephesians 2 8 and 9 was talking about which the denominational world has just totally perverted um, it is um, it, it, it's not a work at all it's a response to the work that God has done for us so if you've not been baptized into Christ, we want to give you that opportunity. And if, uh, as a Christian, you need to bring something before the congregation as we stand and sing the, the closing hymn, uh, it's a good opportunity to come forward and let us know. Thank you, and uh, we'll see you again tonight. Good morning. We're thankful that each and every one of you has chosen to worship with us here at the Jacksonville Church of Christ this morning. Especially to our visitors, we're thankful that you're here. and We invite you back to be with us at any opportunity that you might have. We'll have a few announcements and then we'll be led in a closing, pr closing prayer by Brother Robert White. Some additions to our prayer list. Um, we need to remember those who are listed in the bulletin, of course, uh, that are in need of prayer. And we have some additions to that. Sister Lee Dobson is recovering in Jacksonville Rehab in room 348. Also, Jean Schoonhoven is at RMC Anniston uh, in room 939. Our sympathy goes out to the family of Jewel Kendrick, who is Francis Sh Ship's cousin, who passed away on Friday. Uh, please remember her husband in particular. His name is Ronald and his family at this time. 
Also, we need to continue to remember Mary Neighbors and uh, the Neighbors family and the passing of, of Brother Frank and also Sister Barbara. Um, if you hadn't done so, please pick up a bulletin. Uh, it's got some others who are listed in there that we need to remember as we pray this week. As far as reminders, we need to remember those who are in Darien, Georgia this week. Uh, pray that they have a safe and successful week. There will not be prime timers uh, this month, so if you were planning on coming to prime timers, just make a note that it will not meet uh, this Thursday. Also, we, we have a note that uh, we still have some books entitled Stronger Than Ever uh, from Brother Jackson uh, that he has sent. Those will be $10 if you want to uh, get a copy. Just give your $10 to Brandon or Brother Homer. Uh, that's all the announcements that I have. If you would, let's be standing. We'll be led in a closing prayer. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day and for the many blessings of life that have so bestowed upon each and every one of us. The opportunity we have had this day to come and worship thee, the true and the living God. Heavenly Father, we pray that our worship today has been acceptable and pleasing in our sight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the lesson that Brother Todd brought to us this morning. May we apply those things to our lives and we can all work together.